Nikki Sock, Jessica Toth, and Kisu Kukit. My name is Faith Price. I am of Sonic Man of Wampanoag descent, but I grew up on the Flathead Reservation with the Salish Peace Fest. So I work at All Nations Health Center and the Community Prevention Coordinator. I work on a, on a suicide and substance use prevention grant. And um, my co-worker, Lena Running Crane, would have been here tonight. She's actually the founder of the American Indian Women's Book Club, but uh, she got sick, decided to keep her germs to herself, so she's home uh, wisely. But she's a counselor at All Nations Health Center. And then I'll let my co-presenter introduce herself. Um, I'm Shelby Cole. Um, I'm a scientist at the University of Montana. Um, I'm uh, Baani in Métis, um, and I'm a book club member just for the past year or so, maybe. So, all right. Um, next slide. So, uh, I'll give you a little background about the American Indian Women's Book Club. It has been in existence for about five years now. Uh, we have close to, we have, I think, 71 people, I looked before this, we have 71 people that are on our listserv and, and, uh, uh, at, and are involved in the, in the Women's Book Club in one way or another, um, to whatever capacity they uh, have. But we meet once a month and we read books that are by American Indian female authors. Um, and that there are tons of them, and we never run out. And we're always finding new ones, so it's amazing. Um, so if we were to get this grant, how would we use the money? We would be, um, we provide the books for our membership, which we're happy to be able to do. We started, we found, got some funding a couple years ago and started doing that. Uh, and so we purchase books, um, about 25 copies a month, and the first 25 people to, to snag a book, get them. Um, but we offer both paper and audible. We have some folks that only listen on audible, and, but, and that's how they participate. Uh, so that would be our plan, would be to purchase 25 books a month, which costs around $500 a month um, to do so. We also thought we would uh, love to be able to <coughs> offer some writing workshops for our members, <coughs> new readers also. I'm sure that many of them are also very talented when it comes to writing or would like to give a hand at it. And we have a couple of wonderful local indigenous authors that we are thinking we would invite to do workshops. Um, one is Deborah Erling, who just recently retired from the university. And maybe I shouldn't say this is being recorded, and I haven't asked her yet. And then Heather Cahoon, who is a current University of Montana professor, that both of these are Salish ladies that have asked Heather, and she said, yes, she would love to do a, a workshop. She does poetry, so she would do a poetry workshop, and hopefully Deborah would do some sort of a short story writing workshop. Um, so we would love to be able to offer those. That's something new that we have not done before. And I could mention that we do typically buy our books from, from Fact and Fiction downtown. Like that. We're trying to support local and local women, women-owned bookstore. Um, we also plan on, we would love to, we're going to be reading the book Mean Spirit by Linda, Linda Hogan, which is about um, the Osage tribe in Oklahoma and their experience during the oil rush uh, back in the early 1900s, I want to say. And there's a movie coming out that's on that same topic this May, and it stars Lily Gladstone, who is a Blackfeet, um, Blackfeet actress, opposite Leonardo DiCaprio, so we're super excited. <laughs> that's coming out in May, and we would like to take our entire book club to go see that movie. Yes. Um, and then lastly, we uh, also would like to become a more sustainable organization. We've had conversations across the whole organization about that. And um, would like to reduce waste. I think I failed to mention that when we meet once a month, we have a potluck. Mm -hmm. um, so we meet over food. People contribute all kinds of wonderful. We have some great cooks. Um, but we've been, we've gotten into using paper plates, and, uh, et cetera, and we would like to instead buy some sustainable um, little bento boxes that we could reuse. And uh, I was supposed to mention that Gita Sweeney was one of our, maybe some of you guys know her, Gita. Um, was one of our original members in the book club, and she also really challenged us to be eco-friendly and sustainable. Um, so just in the last year or so, we had 
started using paper plates, but we want to get back away from that. So. Okay, next slide. Uh, the impact that the American Indian Woman Book Club makes on indigenous issues. Um, we provide a forum for indigenous women's voices, which is something not often heard in our community, so somewhere that they can feel heard. Uh, we typically end up discussing life experiences, the so things that we can relate to these books that we're reading, and so things including both trauma and resilience. Stories of trauma and resilience are what we read. Um, and, and I should say we read all kinds of books, fiction, nonfiction, memoirs, well, fantasy, all kinds of things. Um, and these books allow us to process some difficult issues and, and relate them to our own lives and personal narratives. We read both historical things and contemporary works by, because there's just such a wide variety of American Indian women's literature out there. And we've done like, lots of different types of books. Um, but we've most recently, I don't know, we talk about, we've read books about boarding schools and um, the impact of those on real women's lives, et cetera, um, as, and as well as healing and things like that. So just a wide variety of books. Uh, the book club allows us to celebrate unique and shared cultural perspectives. We have many different tribes within Missoula, and so lots of different um, folks involved from different tribes. We learn from each other um, at, these, at these events. Uh, and say, oh, oh, I was going to say, I was just going to say it's fun too that we have so many people from so many different tribes and so it's fun because usually somebody knows somebody who knows somebody that's like a tribe of the book we're reading so it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There is that too, we get the inside scoop yeah. on something. <laughs> experience. Yeah. Um, creates a safe space for connections of people whose lives don't often intersect. So we've got folks like all the way from uh, college faculty like Gita who's participated, and then other folks, um, maybe who are, who are going through it right now, struggling with, with homelessness or struggling with sobriety and things like that. So it brings together a wide mix of folks um, in this space. And in the group, they experience things like the validation of their experiences as a Native person, um, also support, uh, and we'll let Shelby speak more to that in a little bit, but, and, then, and also to experience healing over some of the dip more difficult issues that we do talk about. And then lastly, uh, it's a very intergenerational group. We've got folks that are college students, or recent grads, and we've got other uh, elders and aunties and everything in between. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, transmission of values. We're, we're talking, we're reading indigenous books indigenous, with indigenous values, and, and um, also discussing those things and how they impact us personally. Okay, next slide. And this is Shelby. Turn it over. <coughs> so I'm here to talk as a book club member about um, how this grant would empower the people that we would be at our book clubs, I guess. Um, and so like I said, I'm, um, I'm a scientist. And so I like, was in grad school recently here at UM. Um, and I did not have good experiences. And so um, this book club, I think, is one of the few, I, the only spaces I found that um, was by and for indigenous women. And um, yeah, I think just being an indigenous woman in science is particularly isolating. And so this book club has been amazing to just be able to meet people in the community. Like, I know a ton of people in the community now that I would never have met. And like Leah said, or, with face, <laughs> it's um, from all different um, backgrounds, age ranges. Um, so it's been uh, been great to see other Native women. <laughs> um, and then too, you know, like Faith was saying, we not only relate to the books we're reading, but then we discuss it with each other and we relate to each other. And then it just helps you. You're not alone. You know, like everybody's going through the same issues. It's just that. Um, I think in Missoula, we're kind of, sp like, us Native women are spread out across the city, and so, um, but it's nice to have a place that we can um, all meet and talk about the books we love. Um, and also, um, like Faith was saying, for me, um, accessibility has been great, because as a poor college student, um, I couldn't really bring food, but I, so a lot of times it was like, it was the only home-cooked meal I had that week sometimes. 
Um, and also, the, and they were, of course, understanding if somebody wasn't able to bring food. Um, and two, I'm, I'm the person that uh, can only read um, audiobooks. And so there are a lot of books that I wouldn't have been able to read without the book club because some of them are like audible exclusives and so you can only listen to it if you are, you know, you buy it. So um, yeah, the book club has just been amazing. It's also an opportunity, I think, for us to like demonstrate community care. Um, like not only do you get to like cook something for people and then discuss it, but like you also get so like you get to care for others in the community and then you also get to receive that care. And like I said, just when you're pretty isolated, it's just a rare opportunity. And so uh, the book club has been a really great, safe, and inclusive place. Uh, next slide. Okay, the outcomes that um, we expect from the book club and the things that we're trying to impact are a feeling of belonging. So we've got a, a, diverse, a diverse indigenous community here we're in an urban area or um, many different tribes, like we said. So building that community, uh, breaking down barriers, folks that are from different um, parts of our community, and then also yeah, creating a sense of safety and in, in that belonging, this community, the community that you belong to, feel, feel safe within and safe to express yourself and your experiences. Uh, Secondly, uh, we're working to impact connectedness, so making connection, and we were able to keep the book club going throughout the pandemic via Zoom, and then sometimes we've done hybrid, and then in the nice weather, we're usually outside at a park as long as we can. Um, and then connectedness on, within our, our celebration of our cultural values through visiting, sharing food together. Um, so it's feelings of belonging, connectedness, and then lastly, identity with offering books that are meaningful and um, that folks can relate to because they're things that, yeah, the experiences that they've had or, or um, the language or the uh, experiences of the characters they can relate to. So connection through um, meaningful reads, connection to identity, and then also the conversations we have that we're able to express ourselves as Indigenous women. Um, <coughs> fostering intergenerational connection, which is important to us culturally to have those <laughs> connection to, um, for young people to have connections with elders and having those friendships and support across de different generations. And then lastly, I mean, feelings of acceptance and validation and inclusion around our identity. And we know, um, I'm also a scientist, but a, a prevention scientist, <laughs> and we know that belonging and connectedness and identity are all um, protective factors in terms of um, for suicide prevention and substance use prevention, so we know these things. Um, are, are helpful in that way. So, okay, next slide, next and the last slide, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, our timeline, uh, we would be working with, we have a, we have a, uh, we're very lucky to have an epidemiologist on our staff who helps us to do evaluations, so we would be um, ready, we are already, I mean, we're already meeting monthly anyway, so we're ready to roll with, with um, the book club we would have been meeting tonight, except for this, but <laughs> we'll be meeting again in December, ready to roll, we've got to talk to our epidemiologists to, to do a little more evaluation of the book club and see if we're actually moving the needle on those, on those three, three things, belonging and connectedness and identity. Um, so we would be working with her to develop some evaluation for the grant, uh, but then we would be able to jump right in. We have monthly meetings um, that would happen, and then hopefully a spring and a fall writers workshop, and the movie release party are, are our timeline for 2023 for spending the funds. So I think um, we're good to go there. And then last, last little slide. Just, just thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for considering us, and just also to say that um, you have no bad choices. <laughs> it was really fantastic. I was amazed when I saw the other uh, list of, of finalists, and you know I well. Shelby um, has vended with Indigenous Maine Missoula. I have shopped with Indigenous <laughs> Maine Missoula. And then I think we were talking earlier, some of these folks have been members of our book club, and we've also um, all received plants from Seedlings for Solidarity. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you guys have a win-win here. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the American Indian Women's Book Club? I have two questions. 
Um, how do you guys, how do you spread the word to get other women who might be interested to join your book club? We have, um, we have put things on our social media, not regularly enough, which we were um, talking about needing to do that more often. We have an extensive, I guess we have an extensive email list, and then otherwise word of mouth. So you guys have a Facebook page? Not for the club, but for All Nations Health Centers. So okay, okay. Posted, so we Nations occasionally okay. post on there uh, to encourage people, hey, this is what we're reading. If you want to join us, this is when we meet. So that would be a place to direct someone who might be yeah. interested. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Who picks your books? The club picks the books. When so we meet every month, we try to pick a month in advance so that we can order books in time to give them out at the next meeting. But yeah, the club the club selects. It's usually do. like the members that are there that month that actually meet to discuss. And so yeah, like usually it's after we've already discussed the books and when we're then grabbing seconds that we start talking about the next month's books. So yeah, the members usually. Any other questions? All right, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 So again, a big shout out. One thing I forgot to say, I'm forgetting everything. And that's part of my charm, part of my challenge. But I forgot to say it's so exciting because I want to congratulate all three of our finalists because all three of them, two of them will receive a $1,000 unrestricted gift from the Women's uh, Giving Circle that we made that change consistently now so that that's going to happen. And then we will have the grant recipient that will receive the $10,000 for the project. So really, truly want to congratulate you again. And I also have the privilege of introducing a newly fiscal sponsored organization. Then they'll get to speak about all of that. So I'll let you tell your story. But Daisha Griego, check this out. Leticia Buckout Thunder. I actually want to remember that one, but I'm going to give you your name tag back. She had my back. That's what we do for each other, right? So let's give it up for Indigenous Maid Missoula. such as um, cultural appropriation and misrepresentation. 
um, we asked ourselves questions like, why isn't there indigenous representation in this space? Um, how can I sell my art to help support my family? And where can I find Native American art, jewelry performers, and other talent? Um, we wanted to create a platform where we could respond to those issues. As indigenous women and artists, we understand that the arts have been an integral part of diverse indigenous communities. For countless generations, <coughs> indigenous art continues to be used as a resource to raise awareness of indigenous issues, um, recount history, stories, connection, celebration, inspiration, <laughs> to generate income in both tribal and non-tribal communities. Um, we uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's emotional and nervous at the same time. We host culturally informed events such as the First People's Market, and it's really to create visibility and economic opportunities for indigenous artisans and makers, entrepreneurs. And we want to educate the Missoula community on indigenous issues like the importance of supporting indigenous businesses and harm done by perpetuating cultural stereotypes. So our project is the First People's Art and Talent Network. Um, we will be creating um, the network is a safe, supportive environment for indigenous artists to connect with each other while accessing resources that aren't always easily accessible. Um, our people have endured generations of hardships, including systemic racism and genocide, and art has been, like you said, part of our culture for generations. It's a healing um, tool. It's also um, an economic tool that's untapped in our community. Um, Eloise Cabell, who is Blackfeet, says it best in this quote, art is the greatest asset Indian people have in our community, yet it is the most under, underdeveloped. Um, through our network, we will be creating a safe and empowering community. Our network is also led by indigenous women for indigenous people. And we will be developing strong relationships with artists and consumers to help facilitate unity and growth in our community at large. Um, next slide, please. Our vision for the network and for Indigenous Me Missoula is to have a space where Indigenous people are centered and celebrated, where Indigenous focused events are hosted by Indigenous people, and where every member of our community, from tiny tot to elder, is respectfully represented. It is estimated that 30% of all indigenous people are practicing or emerging artists, and most are living before, below the poverty line. Many Native American households rely on home-based businesses for income with close to 80% of those businesses consisting of some form of art. The First People's Art and Talent Network will empower established and emerging artists to effectively increase their economic success by providing access to professional development opportunities and community support and access to a maker space with tools and supplies that are not easily accessible to produce contemporary and traditional indigenous art. These supports provide some of our most vulnerable relatives the opportunity to increase their income through the indigenous art economy. Our participants include indigenous creatives at all stages of life, from youth to elders, as youth as young as eight to elders. We're already seeing multi-generational families creating and participating in the work as well. In addition to the direct services provided to indigenous artists, Members of the general Missoula community will benefit from programming that includes community education, awareness on indigenous issues, and exposure to indigenous art and culture. I just want to point out on that last slide, it's our girls again. Yeah. <laughs> our first event last year, they were hustling buttons. Um, 
um, should we be awarded the funding, it will go towards three areas. Number one is our makerspace. We'll be purchasing tools, materials, and supplies that are difficult and nearly impossible to find locally. And that includes things like fabric, certain fabrics, hides, shells, quills, beads. Um, number two is technology. A large portion of the funding will go towards technology really to help us operate and organize effectively. Um, this also includes a website where we're hoping to host an artist directory, an online shop, as well as an event calendar. Um, lastly, staffing. We wanted to use a portion of the funds to compensate those carrying out um, the project, including organizers and class instructors. And our project timeline is at three months, supplies are going to be purchased for the makerspace. At six months, our website will be relaunched. And at 12 months, we'll be the proud organizers of a thriving network of indigenous artists, makers, and entrepreneurs. <laughs> Thank you. 
And a lot of those artists are actually mother, sister, mm -hmm. father, daughter. Like they're all auntie, grandma. Yeah, they're all multi generation. Yeah, the majority. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. And did I understand correctly that you're also looking for a space where people can create together? Or was that like a metaphorical space that you're talking about? Yeah. A physical space would be incredible so that we could have a maker space. One of the things that we connected with when our friendship started was creating together and learning from each other and inspiring each other and giving each other ideas. Um, so that's something that we would love to have for the community um, at large. So physical maker space where they could also access the supplies and tools would be awesome. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So now we get to hear from our third finalist, and I'm going to introduce Seed Things for Solidarity and Katie Jacquet. No. <laughs> I worked hard for a bit. No. I worked hard for both. Was that correct? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Katie, and I'll let you introduce Patrick and Shelby. So here's Katie. Seedlings and gardening supplies. 
Uh, we started in January of, 20, of 2021, and it was actually just a very small project. Just a few of us got together and thought, like, hey, we could grow some seedlings on our windowsills, and then we could share them. And it rapidly spiraled into something much bigger as we, um, it became clear there was a real need for this in our community. Um, and we recognize that we have a unique opportunity here in Missoula and Western Montana, which is that people across economic spectrums um, often will have some access to exterior space to grow food. And so we wanted to take advantage of that. Um, and we consider ourselves a food sovereignty, a food sovereignty project. If you um, haven't heard of that term before, I wanted to define it. Um, food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecological sound and sustainable methods, and the right to define their own food and agricultural systems. Food sovereignty recognizes that the right to food is sacred, the work is participatory, it is supportive of self-determination and autonomy of all peoples, and provides a restorative framework for food policy. So what does that mean? What do we actually do? Um, so one of the main things we do is we provide seeds and seedlings to people in the community um, free of charge. Um, in 2022, this last um, spring, we distributed over a thousand seed packets and over 10,000 veggie seedlings. Um, and we did that through um, the use of a greenhouse at the University of Montana uh, Plant Ecology Lab. They had a greenhouse that was being unused. It's like not fit for research grade anymore. And it was actually just being used for storage. Um, and they let us use it. So we've used it for the last two years and we are going to be continuing that relationship moving forward, which is just really incredible for us. Um, additionally, we um, like to think holistically about how we can overcome barriers to growing your own food. There's, when you're starting out, like there's, it can be expensive and you need some resources and you need some knowledge. And so thinking about that and providing, we've provided garden beds and planter boxes compost, soil, gardening tools, educational resources, we've done workshops, and really trying to think about how we can support um, food autonomy. Um, and so, we, in that same vein, we like to center our work on people and communities that are historically and currently being harmed by our economic and governmental systems, and we recognize that justice does not trickle down, it only grows up. And so we have partnered with um, a lot of really great organizations in Missoula and on the Flathead Reservation, including Salt Planning Missoula, and working with refugee communities there, the Missoula Food Banking Community Center, um, the Pavarillo Center, we maintain garden beds in their courtyard, and then also providing um, uh, seedlings to the All Nations Health Center uh, um, to their, their garden program, as well as um, our collaboration with People's Food Sovereignty Program, Garden Network, which Patrick will talk about in a minute. We also this year, um, we had our first community garden started this year in town, which was super exciting. And we have now joined forces with our sister project, Missoula Community Free Fridge, which is a mutual aid project that um, aims to provide access to food to anyone in the community through a network of um, free fridges and pantries. And we were able to use all the food that we grew in the garden to stock our fridges and to make prepared foods for those fridges. So uh, these are our first uh, posters that we've created for the Garden uh, Network program. Uh, the one on the left was, uh, was one that uh, we created in our first year. Um, we then uh, transitioned to the one on the right, um, just giving it more of a you know, friendlier feel, and uh, you know, we have to upgrade. Uh, if you can change the slide, please. Um, our Garden Bed Network uh, has been uh, uh, publicized in the Charcusta. Uh, we had an uh, uh, article written uh, in the year 20, uh, or last year. Um, this is uh, just a setup of um, kind of what you would receive in the Garden Bed Network. Um, this is my wife, uh, Regina, um, pictured. Uh, she is the chairwoman of uh, People's Food Sovereignty Program, and um, this was a great opportunity to get the word out about um, what we've been up to. You can change the slide, please. <clears throat> so, um, when we say all hands on deck, you know, it really does take, um, you know, the efforts of people that really, 
you know, are willing to put, you know, um, you know, break their backs doing this. Um, whenever we first started in our first year, uh, working with Seedlings uh, Solidarity and their group, um, pictured on the left here, we're, we're breaking down the wood. Um, and then also a picture of uh, the seedlings for that first year. And uh, being able to also work with the Missoula community, so many people uh, step up, step up whenever um, we put out, you know, um, ask for volunteers. Um, definitely in our first year, um, Seedlings for Solidarity uh, procured us uh, the um, recycled uh, materials out of the Los Medicine Center um, at Missoula, uh, University of Missoula. And, we're able to uh, refurbish uh, over $23,000 worth of uh, recycled soil, organic black soil, and wood. And um, when when we have to break, we have to break down the material as well. And, and so when we say all hands on deck, there's uh, photos of about uh, 20 people coming from Missoula community uh, just to help us break it down. <clears throat> in the picture in the middle. Uh, is one of our food sovereignty uh, warriors with the um, brown hat on. His name's Lex Pierre. Um, he works with us as one of our employees. And then on the right, again, is one of our interns uh, that, uh, that helped us out with this last uh, summer. Um, he also helped us out with our dry meat, um, figuring out how to use our dehydration system. On the bottom is uh, me and my son. Uh, this was the first bed of uh, last year's season. And you can change the side, please. Uh, our biggest goal uh, when we talk about uh, food sour or this uh, garden bed network is understanding. You know, putting more nutritional foods in your body helps um, fight the you know the toxic kind of processed foods that uh, many many people eat, definitely in tribal communities. And so, being able to have the access to fresh foods in a garden right in their house or right in their backyard uh, really provides that um, you know that ability to grow your own foods grow to nutritional um, uh, value and then um, be able to utilize the physical activity of gardening uh, to help better mental health and um, be able to have an outlet for uh, other types of ways to deal with kind of the historical traumas that are faced in tribal communities, and um, so this is this is just an excellent way uh, for us to be able to connect with the community. Um, the picture in the middle um, is located in Saint Ignatius. Uh, this picture is pretty powerful, uh, just with the historical traumas that have happened with the boarding school there. Uh, uh, this is uh, an elder in the community, and uh, being able to have uh, that garden um, in that area is is. Uh, is really appreciated. On the right hand, or on the top right, uh, is a photo of uh, an elder, uh, Kootenai, out of Elmo. Um, she is um, one of our, uh, you know, greatest supporters. She um, provides constant photos of all the all the foods that she grew, and then how she added it into recipes um, that she, you know, that uh, foods that she ate daily. And so we really appreciate that. And, um, uh, Chief Mountain is in, or Chief Cliff is in the back there. Um, on the bottom right uh, is a uh, garden bed that we've done in uh, Pablo. Uh, pa Pablo is one of the uh, lowest uh, income, or uh, uh, yeah, the lowest income uh, cities in Montana. And um, this was just an excellent opportunity to be able to show that um, you know we go to you know we we travel the distances and make make sure that uh, anybody who needs or wants a garden bed uh, their needs are met. You can change that slide, please. And then another big uh, focus that again that we um, you know try to procure our our supplies uh, is through reduce, reuse, and recycle. And, and just like the Los Mesas Center, how we were able to break that down, we've created relationships with uh, other companies who. Uh, provide refurbished wood, and this is us picking up a, a load of refurbished wood that we provided in our in our second year. And so, you know, being able to utilize this uh, uh, these materials definitely um, to not let them go to waste is, is super important for us. You can change the slide, please. Um, so, Seedlings for Solidarity has we are really grateful to be able to work with People's Food Sovereignty Program on the. Um, Garden Network program. 
um, how we've been involved is then the first year to uh, <laughs> Two seasons ago, we provided garden beds, soil, compost, tools, seedlings, and seeds for 40 of the 51 gardens that they set up. Um, and then this year, 2022, we supplied seedlings and seeds for over 81 um, different gardens on the Flathead Reservation to tribal households. And you can see um, here, we've got boxes of these seedlings. So each um, household got um, like 20 to 30 plants about of all different kinds. We have peppers and tomatoes and eggplants and bok choy and herbs and green onions and everything that you could think of that we grew in our greenhouse and also some that um, we received from other places around town like other um, farms and the peas farm as well. And then we also provided um, a lot of seeds for um, the crops that can just be directly sowed. And uh, a lot of those seeds were provided to us from peas farm again. Um, so grown here in town, organic, and then we were able to um, package those up. And I painstakingly <laughs> made all these little drawings on all of them. <laughs> on 500 different seed packages. Oh, I'm crazy. Yeah. <laughs> delivering seedlings um, up to Ronan. Next slide. So um, why we're here is we are looking to fund our third annual Garden Network program. And this funding specifically would help us to expand participants, um, provide resources to those participants, and support sustainability within our own groups. Um, so right now, yeah, there's over 80 different um, tribal households that participate. And um, Patrick is looking at adding up to maybe 120. Um, and then, um, so yeah, so the money would be, so some of the funding would go to our greenhouse operations, so that would be to purchase some supplies we need for the greenhouse, and then also we have learned through doing this for two years that although we are volunteer run and we want to maintain that, that there is a couple of key um, positions that would be, that require a little more time and energy, so we would love to give a stipend to um, our greenhouse coordinator. Um, the next area of funding would be transportation. So as Patrick has mentioned, um, participants come from all over the Flathead Reservation, which is a huge area that um, they hand deliver everything. So the soil, the compost, the garden beds, everything is hand delivered directly to people's houses. And so that's a, that's a lot of miles to travel. So we'd be able to use um, the money for fuel, and then also, again, we would love to provide a small stipend to a distribution coordinator who would be in charge of kind of coordinating all this transportation, as well as coordinating all the purchases of all the supplies and getting all the packages together for every um, household. And most of the money would be going directly to participants in the program. So it would be going to the lumber for uh, building the garden boxes, soil and compost, and then the gardening tool packages, which we have found that that's one of the most cost intensive parts of this program, because we can get some, we do um, get secondhand stuff from like home resource and we've had garage sales where we've asked people to buy that stuff, but on this kind of scale, we are looking, you, you kind of do have to buy some stuff new, because um, we're talking about hoses and, you know, to me, you know, people might, each person might need three or four tomato cages or, you know, steaks and, um, fertilizer, hand tools, all those kinds of stuff. So that would really help us be able to fill out those packages so that each participant gets everything that they need to be able to be a successful gardener. Next slide. Um, so the timeline for the project, so we're mostly like a spring-based project, so hopefully in January <laughs> we will start the logistics and planning and start talking about like what's worked in past seasons, what we kind of like want to change and what could be better. Um, we'll start growing seedlings in the greenhouse in March. Um, we'll start preparing the packages, including like sourcing all the compost and soil and lumber, buying all the tools and all of that. We will be doing that throughout the spring. And then um, building beds, the garden beds on site and distributing all of these materials happens in May to June, um, about after the um, last frost of the spring. Next slide.
So um, basically, uh, we super like respect the Missoula community and the, their ability to, you know, step up and how Seedlings of, Sol uh, Seedlings of Solidarity um, really provided this opportunity for us to uh, really create this opportunity for healing. And that's kind of like, that's like where, where the foundation of this program um, is established. Um, basically, everything that they provided um, allows us to make everything more efficient. And so being able to, um, being able to utilize this funding will be able to allow us to procure our supplies, um, labor needed to create a garden bed network on the reservation. Um, and so this program, again, is free for everybody. Uh, and we deliver and install, as you said, um, this basically just eliminates all the barriers that uh, any of our tribal households had faced um, in the past and um, just really allows them to get into the program and really a gardening lifestyle. Change the slide, please. Okay, so um, again, our overarching goal is to ensure that this program just allows that easy access into an entry-level gardening program. Um, but a priority, again, is to offer this healthy alternative to addressing our historical traumas. Um, many, many tribal members uh, don't have positive outlets, and what we're trying to do is just expand um, their options to be able to provide, again, something that is just right in their backyard to be able to um, get their hands in the dirt and, and really transform their life. And we were able to see uh, many of our participants, uh, you know, escape uh, lives of alcoholism or drug abuse or even uh, depression or suicide and, and being able to uplift themselves by just um, really, it's really caring for something, um, you know, putting that care into something and seeing it grow. Um, they, they really see the value in that and um, it gives them, you know, it gives them something to live for. And I think uh, that that has been, you know, our super overarching goal of this program. Um, but also uh, being able to, um, you know, lower their dependence on the local supermarkets or food markets on the reservation. Uh, many uh, food markets definitely on the uh, more rural parts of the reservation. Um, like when I say rural, I'm saying like Hot Springs, Dixon, or Alamo. Um, many of these communities uh, don't have uh, grocery stores that provide um, exceptional nutritional foods and um, a lot of times those uh, if they do have grocery stores uh, they close early and they don't you know they only have gas stations and things like that corn markets where they don't have that access to healthy foods and we really allow that opportunity to have you know have those foods be able to sustain them uh, when those stores are closing um, also um, this will alleviate our financial costs and transportation needs, uh, like Katie has said. Uh, and also, um, what we also do is we've provided gardening lessons in our educational video series, and this is, assists our participants and really allows them to see first, like see with, you know, in tribal communities, we you know, we have learned to read books and things like that, but um, a lot of tribal members learn better through video. And we, in our last year, we provided a series of videos that um, engage the participant and, and really allows them to learn uh, from, you know, our, you know, what we're trying to provide to them. And, and definitely in an indigenous, sustainable, agricultural way. Uh, you can change the slide, please. Okay, so our um, everything that you know we're expecting to do um, has been because our program has become more efficient after every year, and the you know definitely working with Seedlings of Solidarity and then our local um, you know landscaping supply stores in the area. Um, and then also, um, again, these uh, refurbished wood companies uh, were able to really source our supplies um, 
and definitely the relationships that we've made with these companies really get discounts on the soil and wood that we need. And so this makes everything really, you know, super efficient for us. And then it also provides, you know, this to keep our money in the local community as well. In our first year, we finished 51 garden beds. In our second year, we distributed 30, so a total of 81. But we understand that, you know, it's, you know, based on volunteership. And when we get to the reservation, you know, there is a source of volunteership, but we really have to pay people to participate in this and really get engaged. And that's, and it's really based because people have livelihoods. And this would help us sustain, you know, the other, you know, to help our funds sustain our people that are in our program. Definitely understanding 51 beds in one season really was a lot of effort. And we all, like, you know, it is aware once you start getting around 30. So we're dedicated from doing like 30 to 35 every year going on from now. And there's around 1,000 houses on the reservation. So, you know, rough ballpark, you know, we're already almost to 100. We're really trying to just get as much out as we can each year as we grow. And this is a program that we're looking to see go on into the far future. And then, again, then we would measure our successes on the beds that we install, as well as the responses of the successes that we hear from our program participants. And then also, whenever participants, you know, we ask them for photos and things like that, they send us photos of their gardens that they're growing, you know, the successes of their gardens, as well as when they make harvest, they show us how they've incorporated those foods into their diets and their daily meals. Thank you. And that's it. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening to our presentation and your consideration and your generosity. It's been wonderful to be here. And, yeah, if there's any questions or comments for us. Questions? Molly? So, if a tribal member is living in Missoula, could they also put a bed in their backyard? Um, definitely. So, through Seedlings for Solidarity, we we partnered with um, People's Food Sovereignty Program for specifically um, the tribal members um, that they focus on, but we also do the same thing in Missoula County. Um, yeah, we, we've worked with All Nations Health Center for their garden program that they already have going, and then we also have like basically an open call um, for anybody in Missoula County and in the community to be able to get these same services. Do you usually have... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Marcy. <laughs> Do you usually have more requests than you can uh, meet, or, or is it? Do you have to really get the marketing out to, uh, to get the word out, or what's the demand? Um, there's definitely more than we can meet for sure. So, yeah, uh, Patrick could speak specifically for the Flathead Reservation in Missoula County. Here, we, um, yeah, it's we we've tried different kinds of distribution methods and like how we contact people. Um, this last year, we did a lot through the food bank, which we found really successful because one, it really like targets the demographics that we're we're trying to hit, and then so we distributed through there and also tabled. So we would be there every week and would be like giving out seedlings and seeds and say, hey, do you need anything else? Is there other materials? Do you need? Do you want to sign up for a garden bed or a compost box? And there's there's so many people that are are interested in that. So. Definitely more need. <laughs> Cindy, did you have a oh and then I'll come to you, Glenn. Did you have a question or did you? Okay. Glenda? Are you able to get back to those, um, and it might be for Patrick, get back to like those first first year gardeners so that they keep it up through the years? Patrick, could you hear that question? No, can you repeat it? 
the, the question is, is um, do we get back to the first year gardeners and see how they're doing and oh. what the results are? Oh yeah. Yeah, what we do is um, definitely uh, in our first year we did some um, garden planning bo planner boxes and uh, those deteriorated over the winter time so we went in and um, replaced their planter boxes with new beds. Um, we also um, provide any type of compost or soil replacement or refills that they may need and then we'll, um, they'll, uh, we'll contact them and let them know that we're bringing seeds for delivery when, um, when those are ready. And I think Patrick, correct if I'm wrong, but just about every single person that participated in the first year, we also um, serviced the second year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Every year we provided uh, follow up and seedlings. So it's a, so it gets into their lifestyle every year to do their garden. Yep, exactly. Kathy, yeah, I was wondering if you um, have noticed a need uh, for educating people on how to use fresh produce, and if so, how you're responding to that. Um, so Patrick, there was a question about um, is there a need for education around how to, how to use fresh produce and how are we responding to that need? Well, we, uh, we also have on our website uh, recipes and then uh, other ways to how to preserve foods or use it in, uh, in different dishes. So we provide uh, those types of educational materials as well. So I'll speak, uh, so Patrick, the question is about um, uh, funding and, and volunteers. I'll speak for Seedlings for Solidarity first. Um, so currently we are all volunteer run. We follow a mutual aid framework, which is a little bit different than a charity or a nonprofit framework um, that largely is really looking at using volunteer work. And instead of, we um, don't use a top-down hierarchy model. We actually use consensus decision-making. So we don't have an executive director. Um, and in fact, we try to get, the, the idea is to be, everyone should be able to participate as much as they want and be able to participate in decision-making. And so we use a consensus decision-making for that process. However, <laughs> that said, we have, we have recognized that, like I was saying about these stipends, is that there are a couple key you know, it would be great to get some funding to to have some, to have some staff, but it does complicate that model. So we really have to think about that and talk about that as a group. And because you don't want the person who's getting paid to be the person that's making the decisions, because that's not our model. So how do we go about that? And I do think we're at the stage now that we're we're having real conversations about that. Do you have a question, Jamie, or were you just I'm just sitting there? Are there any oh, yes. more questions? Um, if you were to receive this grant, what would you do for funding after the grant to be able to continue this program? Um, Patrick, the question is about um, after this uh, grant, where would we find funding in the future? Well, uh, there's different opportunities that um, are, we're creating through other businesses uh, to help donate or you know help sustain this into the future uh, um, right now in terms of people's food sovereignty program um you know we started as a grassroots um, organization we moved into fiscal sponsorship um now that now with the growth of it we know that um, the next step is is establishing a 501 uh, you know a fully functional 501c3 um and being able to um, provide that kind of structure for the organization yeah, and for seedlings. I'm sorry, did I, nope. I didn't answer your question at all? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and for seedlings for solidarity, we, we're also fiscally sponsored. CFAC is our fiscal sponsor. And yeah, we try to use them. Um, one, we did apply for some grants our first year, but it's like, it's your first year, you know? So now that we've been doing this for three years, I think now we're really trying to apply for more grants and we're able to do that because we're fiscally sponsored. And then um, we also use just like a diverse array of tactics to be able to get funding. A lot, again, a lot of using secondhand materials and having people, you know, because it's interesting because a lot of what we do actually doesn't require that much money. The tools, that part does, 
but by actually growing the seedlings and the seeds, we're getting a lot of in-kind donations. Like I said, th this year we've, we scoured all, so you may not know this, but um, stores at the end of the year, they just usually throw all their seeds away. Um, so we were able to, we, we through some dumpster diving and through some <laughs> in-kind donations, we have thousands of packets of seeds now that we're gonna be um, distributing. Um, so we, we do a lot of in-kind donations, both new and secondhand, from um, local businesses and from individuals, and we fundraise on um, PayPal and Venmo, and we participated in the Missoula, um, the Missoula Giving. Um, Missoula Giving. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if you could do that with compost, too, you know, get compost contributed. Um, and we have, so we have, so Peas Farm, off, uh, Peas Farm and um, Garden City Harvest both let us use compost. Uh, Peas Farm has a huge, huge, huge pile up at their farm that they let us just come. So we usually come and like back a truck right up to it and fill it up. We've, we've got, um, our first year we got a ton of rice bags actually um, from restaurants in town and, and um, coffee bags like burlap and we filled those up with compost because that was one thing. It's like how are we going to get all this compost individually to each person? Yeah. And so yeah, we use these burlap rice bags to do that. Any more questions?